thank you all for coming. I'm really happy to welcome you back, Dr. Andy Henderson, who I'm calling Andy, okay? Yeah. Uh, so from here on, uh, we have come out from Boston to the event seminar today. This has been really quite terrific. Um, uh, Andy uh, got a PhD here in California at the University of uh, California, Woodside, in biomedical sciences. And then he uh, did a postdoc at Columbia University of New York City in immunology. And then went on to a first faculty position at Penn State in uh, the veterinary and biomedical sciences. And then moved to uh, Boston University School of Medicine, where he is uh, now a professor of medicine and also assistant to the graduate medical science. And I just want to put him in the study section, I think, to take the life and the study section, which he subsequently uh, took care of. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you, in this uh, CV, which I'm holding here, there are not only a lot of uh, impressive uh, research portfolio in terms of publications and grants, but the service activities that have been done really remarkable. A lot of this is a list of students that he has mentored during our division. And it's very impressive. I don't know how he's got anything else done. But um, yeah. that he has, and he, he really has combined. Um, I think I just see a remarkable expertise in uh, immunology with um, cell biology and uh, virology mm -hmm. and really biochemistry, detailed biochemistry about HIV transcription. And, and he was among the first to really focus on negative, negative regulatory proteins that work as the HIV promoter. And of course, this is tremendously relevant to uh, latent infection and control of that and activation. Of that, and we would do all our research and your strategy. So, thank you so much for coming, and we're looking forward to that. Oh, thank you, John. Everybody hear me okay? That's for his introduction. Well, because he's here. It just means I get really good students in my lab, mm -hmm. postdocs, and that's how I, uh, I manage both the, the service and the, the, the science. Okay. Uh, anyway. So today, okay, this will work. All right, yeah. Um, so what I thought I would do today is sort of kind of present a few stories and, and, and give you an idea of my lab and, and how we approach certain problems. I'll spend probably most of the time on sort of unpublished, maybe not ready for client time stories, but then I think sometimes those are the most fun to present because then I actually get some feedback and uh, you know maybe it's a little nicer if I get from. Uh, for um, so, um, <laughs> so, so anyway, the other thing is I encourage you to ask questions as we go along. If you have questions, feel free to interrupt and I'm happy to have a conversation. Uh, you know, we have to move along a little after this. Okay. So in general, this is to highlight some of the questions and, and interests of my laboratory. So um, this is great because I know we're all fairly familiar with HIV, so I don't think we're going to go through the life cycle. But we're really interested in this intersection of the cell biology and signaling pathways in terms of regulating different outcomes of virus replication. Now, this is not only at the level of viral transcription, although that tends to be the primary focus. The first question, usually, if you say, oh, does this signal pathway influence HIV? We'll usually look really at transcription first, but we have looked at a variety of uh, other parts of the pathway, including entry and, and virus release and targeting the membrane. And uh, so really the goal of the lab is to understand not only the transcriptional networks, but what are the signals upstream that are regulated. And some of the specific questions that we're answering, and hopefully I uh, touch upon them at some level or another today, is one, we want to understand what cells are getting late in the event. Okay? And, and, and in part, I think this is really important because I think these cells are going to have intrinsic properties that really are going to dictate whether the virus gets expressed well or not expressed well, if it's extinguished or not extinguished. Okay? We want to understand the biochemical mechanisms of this and, and the targets, you know, and the, 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 the contribution of post transcription factors and specific signaling pathways. Because if we're thinking of multiple targets, which is this point here, these are probably what we're going to need to disrupt and, and, and inhibit. And then um, we're interested also in this sort of intersection between HIV inflammation and pathogenesis. And so we have a, a few projects going on where we're trying to dissect that out and, and the dysregulation that's associated with HIV infection and, and how that, that essentially.
essentially a new response to not only HIV but other diseases by the human core of HIV. Okay, so just a reminder, okay, this is one of these slides I have to have up here, but HIV rates is important. Okay, so you probably are all familiar with figures like this where if a, uh, you have a patient that has essentially a high plasma load, you start treatment, virus uh, load drops down to undetectable levels, and as soon as this treatment is interrupted, virus almost immediately rebounds within a week or two. Okay, so this is where is this virus coming from? What are the cell types? And, and how can we maintain or either purge this virus or keep this virus shut off to get it over the cure? And again, this is just a reminder that the antiretroviral therapies aren't stopping virus infection, but they're preventing reinfection. And this latency pathway, if you don't have the drug or interrupt the treatment, will then refuel this infection and lead to more virus replication. Okay. So, this is a major barrier to eradicating HIV. Okay, so the virus not only replicates by the spread of this pathway, but that cells divide and expand because it integrates the cell's gene. And so, until we resolve this problem and know what cells and target these cells, then we're not going to cure HIV after our primary goal. Okay, it's a rare people will say to paradigm is that HIV latency is a relatively rare event. And if you look at peripheral blood, you're probably looking at somewhere between one in a million to maybe one in a hundred thousand, depending on the assays that you're using. And we now have you know, the, you know, there's a lot of assays out there. I've been talking about assays and I appreciate you guys educating me about that. And, and, and but I think part of the problem is, is this is data based on peripheral blood. We don't know what's happening in different tissues. And gets back to the sort of idea that we don't really even know what cell populations are contributing to this present. Um, there's a really kind of a lack of model. So we're just now starting using omic approaches to really understand what's happening in patient populations. But for the most part, we're using various cell models where we're differentiating why the cells are coming down here from the pathway. And this might be biasing it, our results for different mechanisms of latency. And finally, uh, you can get repression of the gene in a lot of different ways. And so you can have changes in chromatin. You might have promoter concentration. There are RNA uh, I mechanisms that you can imagine that all distinguish this. So is this a, a this is a, another problem that we need to really try to understand? Are there sort of pathways or a nexus of signals that might influence these multiple pathways or are there predominant pathways? Okay. So this is a, uh, a figure that I think kind of captures a lot of these questions is around latency from a, a, one of Bob Silicon's papers. And, and what this shows is uh, samples. These are patients that were treated with ART, and they went in and they sequenced the virus and, and also did viral pathway counts. Okay? And so the little yellow dots are the, what they detected when they did viral outgrowth assays. The magenta, a shell here represents the number of intact viruses they can detect by sequencing. And then the purple represents all the profile sequences that they were able to uh, sequence. Okay. So there's a couple of things I had that strike me about this. Okay. One is that there's a lot of virus in here that we don't know what it's really doing. Okay, at least based on viral outgrowth assay, you know, why what's this population of virus? This should be Trust, or it should be able to be reactivated. And do, so, do we need to worry about this population? Yeah, I think it's interesting this larger with this thought to be defective virus. What's that doing in terms of contributing to the disease? Are you getting spurious transcription from this? Is this somehow reshaping immune responses or even actually diverting those immune responses away from the HIV? I don't know. And then the thing that really jumps out at me is as you look at all, what is this like, nine patients here, it's all very different in terms of the sizes of all these reservoirs and even the percentages of all these. So how is this established? It seems like it's very unique in terms of how it's established in each of one of these individual groups. So could there be early factors, maybe pre-existing conditions, or at the time of infection, an immune response that might be influencing the actual establishment of HIV infection. And so one way we started thinking about this, and, and again, I tend to be a little bit self-centered in our exposure, was like the question of T-cell development. So you have naive T-cells, 
And these cells often are influenced in terms of how they differentiate or mature into either effective populations of, um, and uh, memory populations based on the strength of the signal. So in general, the paradigms are if you have strong signaling through the, the antigen receptors, you get effector cells, these expand, they proliferate, and they will then essentially resolve their activities through apoptosis. A subset of these will also generate memory cells. Okay? But that weaker signals can also lead to the, the direct development of memory cell population. Now, if HIV is infecting cells in the context of this activation scheme, then you could also imagine that HIV would sort of ride the maturation process to ensure whether it would be expressed or potentially into a cell that harbor late. And remember, I guess I should have said this a slide ago, uh, but it's the, central, uh, the different T cell memory populations which are thought to be the primary reservoir for HIV. Okay? So thinking about it this way, we, we had a very simple hypothesis that strong signals would support active HIV replication. And if, if by altering these signals, maybe we could essentially manipulate the size of the way the reservoir. Okay? And so how are we going to do this? And the, the challenge is that you have a large repertoire of T cells. And, 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 and the, each receptor is about one in a million for any peptide and you'll see uh, class two interaction. So yes, we could probably grow peptides and antigen stem cells, but we have to do several rounds of amplification. And, and I would say, who knows exactly what cell type you have that you And what we wanted to do was to capture this process as close as we can. So I had a conversation with Wilson Wong, who was a bioengineer uh, in, in a, uh, at BU, and he had this panel of chimeric antigen receptors. So these were receptors that the extracellular domain was generated by a, a, a immunoglobulin light chain that recognized HER2, and that was its ligand. And HER2 really is a model ligand, but it, it, it's a receptor type of high age. Uh, it's, it's been it's a, a popular target for a number of cancers, uh, breast cancers and colon cancers in particular, but it gave us a way to control activation of these receptors. And what we used for this, the intracellular portion were domains for CD28, CD3 zeta, and then we had a cherry tag to follow expression of our chimeric antigen receptor. I should point out the, the, the studies with the chimeric antigen receptor, I guess it's at the bottom of the slide we recently published. Uh, in plus pathogens a couple months ago. So if I go fast, one, probably to slow down. Two, uh, you have the papers there. So I'm going to probably go through this a little, a little bit more quickly. Um, now, one reason why we decided to look at this receptor system was that Wilson built a number of these receptors that had different binding affinities. So we had a receptors that had very high binding affinities and they could signal strongly. And we had ones that were low binding affinities, and this was about a order of four logs, and we had receptors that were in between. So what we hoped that we could do through these binding affinities was to basically modulate the signal. And so have basically the same population as these four primary cells overexpress these chimeric antigen receptors and then activate through these to give differential signals. Okay, so this was going to be how we're going to solve this problem of modulating the signal. And uh, we, we can overexpress these, we can sort them. And in general, the experimental plan is here. So we'll take CD4 positive cells, all the data I'm showing you with the chimeric antigen receptors are using CD4 primary cells. We can transduce them with the cards and select again with our cherry tag. And then we can go in and infect HIV in the presence or absence of HER2. So strong with weak signals or no signals. And then we would monitor HIV expression and pro viral DNA. So what did we see? Okay, so initial results, um, we're looking, so let's take the proviral integration. What we find is that when we're looking, and this is an ALU PCR phase, we look at integrated virus. What we see is that regardless of the low affinity or high affinity, or whether we actually have ligand or not ligand, we get fairly comparable levels of HIV infection. Okay, so any outcome we see is probably not related to the virus not getting into the cell. The virus seems to be getting into the cell. Signals don't seem to be particularly important in RN and in, in DASA. However, when we look at HIV expression, and 
this is using a single round of separates wires. We've also validated with some RNAs. What we see is that the high affinity, okay, we get a very robust signal and, and we get good replication and expression of the virus, okay. But with the low affinity, when we activate, we get really modest level of virus expression, okay. And if you probably, the first thing I would sort of expect for me to say is no dub, we throw PMA or C328 when we infect up, so we can get a lot of expression. So I think in one way, this shows our system works, at least with the strong and low signal, and it's sort of supporting our hypothesis in some ways because what we're thinking is, wow, we've got all of these latently infected cells. Because again, I want to emphasize we're not seeing any changes in infection. Okay. But what so so the, the hypothesis now is those low affinity receptors have this larger pool of, of latent infected cells. So we had to do the experiment. So the experiment again is summarized here. So we have our uh, uh, T cells with their the, the chimeric antigen receptors that are infected. This in this case we're using a GFP, although this all looks kind of green, so the brighter green and not the split P super green. Um, so these would be infected and expressing virus, and then we would have a population that are latently infected. We'll eliminate these by self-sorting, take the negative cells, and then reactivate these with either PMA, C328, whatever, latent conversion agent. And so when we did this experiment, we saw some activation in that low affinity, but to our, I guess maybe our surprise, um, we saw essentially a hundredfold more reactivation with the high affinity. So not only was the high affinity signals required, or robust T cell receptor signaling required for active replication, but it seemed to be required for the establishment of this reversible reservoir. And this wasn't only just for PMA and onboard. We looked at a number of other latency reversing agents, and in almost all cases, except maybe Bryostat, which just really didn't do a lot in our hands, um, we saw that the low affinity cells were not as easily reversed as what we saw with the primary cells. So the, the sort of first story I'm telling you then is suggesting that strong signals are important for HIV replication and generating a population of easily reversible latent infected cells. And that in the absence of strong signals, okay, we tend to generate this deep-seated latent population. Now, we don't know, and we're trying to look at this, can we reactivate these cells in any way? We don't know if these cells potentially transition into other populations, and we don't know exactly the status of the virus when we're doing the experiment. One idea that there's a couple of beers being bet in the lab is that maybe these are defective viruses because there wasn't enough time for proper reverse transcription to happen. We need to have more defective viral here. But the point being is this population seems to be behaving very differently than this population in terms of latency reversal. Now, but this, this is a system, right, where we're doing this essentially we have the CD4 cells and we have the virus and we're adding them together with signals. And then I know that doesn't look very much like how T cells function. So T cells typically recognize antigen or at least CD4 positive T cells in the context of class two and peptides, and this is presented by the energy presenting cell. So is there something special about T cell receptor signaling, or is there something about just the context of signaling that a cell um, happens to find itself in that kind of detection? And keep in mind, you're gonna have cytokines, you're gonna have co-stimulation signals, and cell adhesion molecules with inside outside signaling pathways. So you would have enough a number of, of pathways inputting and influencing it. My, what the beta is for virus. Okay. So when we so we basically repeated the experiment that I just showed you with dendritic cells, but again we had chimeric antigen receptors that we could manipulate with a high and low affinity uh, receptor engagement. And when we do this experiment here, so here's the low affinity, we'll start with the proviral infection. We don't see any major change of infection. And again, it seems to be fairly independent of cell receptor signaling. However, when we look at HIV expression in this model system, okay, now we can rescue to a certain extent HIV expression with the low affinity receptors. Not significantly different than what we see with the high. Okay. 
So the way we're interpreting this, also with some of the data that I'm not showing with the mid-range affinity receptor, that there's when we're modeling or predicting that there's a signaling threshold. And it's not so much whether the receptor is engaged, obviously you need some sort of signaling to, to get expression, but it's really the culmination of multiple signals and achieving that different pressure. And so one thing we want to understand better are what are the nature, uh, the nature of some of these signaling pathways and how they're getting integrated to have these different outcomes. So I'm going to take a bit of a tangent here with some other new experiments or some other experiments that we're thinking about that I think are somewhat loosely related to this. And this is sort of pre-existing condition that might be influencing HIV replication and infection. And so you can imagine there's a lot of interest now in microbiome, so maybe common bacteria um, that we're constantly exposed to um, could somehow influence infection. And so we had a, a paper a, a couple of years ago looking at ginger ballast and showing that ginger ballast can actually uh, promote uh, TLR4-dependent mechanism late infection of the primary macrophage population. Uh, in addition, we have an active project going on with Kristen Chang at BU, and she is using uh, single cell RNA seq approaches and attack seq approaches to look at brain changes and opioid use. And we're using a, that, um, her uh, expertise to look at opioid users and HIV disease and weight. So, in another scenario where we think that opioid use itself might be influenced in the course of HIV. And recently, and I'll tease you with a little data, but again, this is really kind of very early data, um, maybe pre-existing conditions and diseases might influence HIV. So TB and HIV is considered a endemic. If you look at approximately 10 to 20%, and depending on what part of the world you may be, that number could be as high as 80% of HIV positive patients have TB. And the mortality that is associated with HIV, uh, something like 30% of deaths worldwide currently are associated with TB. And again, that can go up to like on board 80% if you're in a region like South Africa. So we had, this is a very naive experiment, but we um, took a cohort of, of, of patients from the TB clinic. We had normal patients that should be not TB positive. We had patients that were skin test positive that had no symptoms of TB, so they were our latently infected individuals. And then we had skin test positive and symptoms of TB uh, confirmed by both culture and x ray. Um, and those were our TB active disease. And the experiments that we did was basically we took blood from these individuals, we did some cytokine analysis and flow cytometry looking at the T cell populations. And basically, we saw some changes in cytokines, nothing super striking. If anything, the late patient had maybe a little bit higher level of some of the inflammatory cytokines, uh, TNF, uh, RAGE, and I think some of the interferons. The flow cytometry markers, we saw a dampening of activation markers associated with those in the late patients, but with the normal and uh, TB active, they were comparable. And then we took the CD4 cells, and, and I guess this is the naive part of it, and we just asked, could they support HIV infection to the same extent? So the idea that the, the sort of the overriding hypothesis is here is that by being exposed to TB, there would be left an immunological footprint. And that could maybe be found in the CD4 positive cells, and even though it would be an indirect mechanism, it may change the susceptibility of these cells to HIV infection. So we've done this experiment. Um, this is looking at P24 levels. We can confirm this also with RNA levels um, and expression levels. And what we see is that the late population supports more HIV replication. So when we look at levels of DNA, which is shown here early on, we see comparable levels of, of proviral DNA. This increases because this is a model where we can look at spreading infection over the course of time that we see an increase in the latent TB population, and this again correlates with the P24 values. So it appears that the latent TB cells 
are more susceptible to getting diabetes, whereas we don't see as much of a difference in those uh, with our healthy and active people. And then we think this is significant in, in, in some way because so many people have been exposed or have not been diagnosed and have had to be, and this could be really influencing the And then we try to understand this mechanism and, and, and ask questions about ways we have very preliminary data that suggests that the active TB has a larger link to the work to the link. Now we reply to the fact that the latent TB is just better at replicating the virus and not describing it. Yeah, so the strongest correlation we have is that the latent population are memory cells. And the, the, the markers are for stem cell memory and uh, that they can affect the memory. The, the markers are for so that's the strongest correlation. So none of the cytokines really correlate, and it's just good that those are some markers. So it seems to be there are more of these biased T cell populations, the virus is probably. Now, why are they inactivated? I don't know. Because you would imagine that, that those might be late. Okay. Um, but, but that's the strongest correlation to that. And then, yeah, that is. Yeah, so a subset of our TB patients, and there doesn't seem to be a correlation, um, have been treated, and then we were treated like several years ago and haven't had reactivation. So, yeah, um, so that's part of that latent pool, and then they don't fall out one way or the other. So coming back to, to the, this model here, one of the, the, the interest in the lab is to really understand what's going on biochemically. And so we were interested in asking whether the provirus in these different cells that represent these different, I guess, stages of virus replication and latency, if we could see any difference in terms of the epigenetic regulation of those populations. And so this is a reminder that, at least for me, HIV latency is a problem with transcription, and that HIV transcription is regulated by, essentially, there's three limiting steps in this pathway. One is transcription initiation, which we consider the recruitment of transcription factors to the, the LTR, which is the promoter and enhancer of the provirus. Um, and then these help recruit RNA polymerase and associated factors. And then this will determine the persistiveness or efficiency of this RNA polymerase. And for HIV, we get an initial transcription of the first about 100 bases, and you get an RNA stem loop here that recruits a, a viral factor, TAP. This is the only viral factor involved in this mechanism, which then recruits a, another complex called PTAP B that has a kinase activity, which then modifies this complex to now assure efficient transcription and increases and super enhances this RNA polymerase activity and promotes the propagation. And then the third step is that there's a position nucleosome here. If this is an open chromatin structure associated with acetylation of the histones, for example, then you have a free path to have active transcription. However, if this is shut down or closed through, let's say, activities of things like deacetylases and methotransferases, then you would have this as a tight barrier to block this. And so it's one five that is a block. So all three of these are considered important checkpoints for HIV transcription. And so what we wanted to ask was, was there sort of a predominant thing? So for example, maybe one hypothesis would be that in the deep-seated latent uh, cells, we would have all of these repressive mechanisms here, and that would really shut it off tight. Whereas if it's getting expressed, we'll have an active polymerase, and we'll find polymerase associated with downstream sequences, and some of these negative factors would be absent, and we have a nice one. So we did this by using chromatin immunoprecipitation assays, and we looked at H3 acetylation to give us some indication of this position nucleosome, whether it was in an open or closed state. We looked at RNA polymerase and whether it was associated with this transcriptional start site or downstream, about 5,000 base pairs downstream of the transcriptional start site. And then we also looked for a negative elongation factor called NEL, which is shown to be necessary to block this RNA polymerase activity. 
So when we look at H3 acetylation and RNA polymerase, what we see is regardless of the signals, and even in the absence of signals, we see that you have acetylated histones and that polymerase is associated with the polymerase. So in all of these cases, regardless of signals there or not, this is, an, this is fine for expression. So, to make, so this argues that it's not limited by this position nucleus. It's not limited by the recruitment of the polymerase. Okay. Now, when we look at the polymerase downstream, okay, what we see in the context of the low affinity receptors is that the polymerase is not progressing downstream. So we see less polymerase associated with these downstream sequences where the high affinity, and this is signal dependent, gets is recruited or it, uh, translocates downstream of the proviral DNA with these high signals. Okay. So there seems to be a release. So is this NELF factor getting released? Yes, that's what we see here. The signals are releasing NELF, freeing this polymerase, and allowing for stuff to transfer Of course, TAG would be feeding back and then amplifying the response. So it seems the major checkpoint in, in all of these populations that we've been generating is still at this level of RNA polymerase too. And it seems to be in a state of ready to be fired. And then, so one of the questions now that we're trying to understand and appreciate is what's limiting this? Okay, what's controlling this? Where are these signals coming in? So we're starting to do experiments to look at recruitment of PTFB. So PTFB itself has a fairly complex regulation system where there are RNA particles which sequester this. So maybe that's where T cell signals are getting integrated in, in this process of being controlled. The other aspect is that there's other higher order complexes, super elongation complexes. And so these are in the perfect position because they're regulated by phosphorylation and methylation and a variety of other events that could then be used to integrate different signals. So we're also looking at those different components uh, to try to understand these signals. Yeah. Just a dumb question. Go back to the um, So this is measuring just after the initial Simulation with the low and high affinity, right? Right. So that would go on to then actually, like, do an experiment with the spiral correct? Right, right. So, so this is pretty much what's happening at the time of the signaling response. So it would be sort of having that kind of key infection. Okay. All right. So now, one thing to keep in mind is that. T cell subsets are very different, and quiescent cell populations are very different than effective populations. The one reason why they're different is they express different genes. Right? And they express different genes because they express different transcription factors. You have with each cell type they essentially transcriptional networks that are influencing that outcome. Now, if HIV is infecting these populations, you would imagine that HIV would co opt intrinsic factors or networks. To then determine or have an influence whether it's infected or not, or uh, replicating or not replicating. And so, for example, you might make an argument that when one, which is very important for T cell maturation, it's a very strong repressor, okay, it should, you know, intuitively it should be a repressor for HIV because these are the cells, these are various memory cell populations, and when one's important for the differentiation, HIV is in those cells, maybe that's a key repressor factor. Um, and based on this sort of rationale, and based on actually uh, having conversations with people from the lab I did my postdoc in, <laughs> we said, okay, what one makes a lot of sense to look at. And we did, and this again, this is published, and I'm not going to really talk too much about this other than cell specific factors that really am trying to handle this home seem to be very important in terms of the repression of HIV bias of populations and then so intrinsic factors are important. So we see blood is expressed very at very high levels in terms of uh, in different memory populations. And this here is actually a Western plot and this is looking at RNA levels. And if we do experiments like where we overexpress blood in primary cells, we can repress HIV even in the presence of TAP. So it's a very, very strong repressive TAP overcomes the number of repressive mechanisms. So and then if we do knockdown experiments, Shown here, when we knock down blip, we can reactivate. So it looks like a classic repressor. 
And we play on to characterize that this is acting at both the level of protein and preliminary uh, activity. But again, I, I happen to have a conversation and somebody said, have the limit. And it made sense to do the experiment, but it was all based on sort of just, again, just sort of dumb luck and saying, okay, I think you can do this. There must be a better way to actually do these experiments in an unbiased way. And I can tell you that, you know, most of what we know about HIV transcription was, was generated by people like me in the 90s, scanning the sequences and saying, oh, that was like an NFAP B site. Oh, that was like an AP1 site. Oh, that was like two B sites. And then, you know, we do the experiment, overexpress things, and it would work because the sites were there. So it wasn't really sort of a functional assay ever. So, Again, based on uh, this one was generated by a cup of coffee after Juan from the mass came in and told us about this way that he was characterizing cytokine uh, promoters using this yeast one hybrid. And so uh, this is fairly classic yeast one hybrid system, but he has designed to do this in a high throughput way. So the two components are your DNA bait, and in this case, we're using LDRs. As our DNA bait, and they're driving two selectable markers. One's lag C, so that gives us a color readout when colonies are growing and expressing this. The other is a nutrient requirement uh, for his three, so we can add his three to cultures and or remove it in the absence of his it'll grow. So it's a double selectable marker. And then we have a mating strain, which is basically uh, transcription factors with activation domains. Now, what makes this unique is that he's cloned or it's generated about 1,500 of these strains, which is about 75 to 80 percent of all the transcription factors in the human body. Okay. So this is a heteroallogous system, so we don't need tissues or cells, we don't need antibodies, and this is looking at the direct interaction that we need. So these are the advantages. There are disadvantages, okay? This is yeast. The chromium structure of yeast for the LDR are probably going to be different than the yeast. But um, it also favors, it doesn't allow the heterodimeric interaction. So a lot of factors that we know regulate HIV, um, you know, like antipathy, DPT are, are multiple, okay? So we do get monomeric interactions, but we're not going to get heterodimeric kind of interactions with multimeric. Okay, so we've done this assay. Um, and here's sort of an, an example of some of the data we've generated. We've looked at a couple of type B LTRs here, uh, and then we've looked at a couple of HIV2 RNAs just to, to kind of see what happens. And, it, and again, this is all fairly new data, and, and, and it's a very incomplete story. Um, so uh, excuse me if you feel a bit. Um, so a couple of things jump out. So first off, we identified a new factors. We identified at least 40 factors that have not been described in the literature as being uh, been shown to regulate HIV transcription. And all the factors that we got hits on were expressed in an immune type cell, in CD4 population and myeloid cell population. Some of these factors, especially some of these uh, Krupal-like uh, zinc finger factors, uh, which are here, we've got a lot of these factors that we're binding, seem to be both um, binding HIV-1 as well as HIV-2. But the other thing that was surprising, and then I'll come back to this, is that there would seem to be some factors that were unique to HIV-2, which started making us wonder, could HIV-2 have a unique transcriptional network that might even explain some of its properties of an attenuated HIV virus and maybe some of the pathogenesis Associated with monocytes. So, of course, now we have these hits, we want to validate them and show that this is a, a, a reliable and good screen. So, we initially have started with these uh, uh, proof of life factor proteins, KLF2 and 3, for, and partly because they're regulated in, uh, in T cells. So, these are naive T cells here, and when we activate them with CD3 and 28, we see rapid uh, decline in, in KLF2 expression. We, from this by Western, and a more gradual decline of about tenfold with the KLF3. I should point out that KLF2 has been shown to be important at least for T helper 17 cells, or, or actually, sorry, T follicular helper cells, uh, which had actually been uh, suggested to be a major reservoir of, of T cell replication, and, it, and it's down regulated as those cells mature. KLF3 
Um, there's only one report that may regulate the immune cell function, um, but it's involved in a number of different cancer and growth regulation in, in various epithelial cells. Um, and we do see expression in T cells. So we've done shifts. These are from primary uh, CD4 cells that can be infected with HIV. We see that, um, uh, so this is KLF2, these are controls. We see that KLF2 and 3 can be shifted in the context of these CD4 infected cells, so they seem to be binding sequences. And then if we knock things down and we get about 50% knockdowns in the primary cells, we see about a two-fold increase in uh, uh, HIV expression. So it appears to be that KLF factors are acting as suppressors, um, and it, it seems that these are strongly associated with the generation of, uh, with, uh, or maintaining a uh, low replication in less than population. Okay. Going back to HIV-2, so I sort of proposed that maybe we found HIV-2-specific factors, and this is just to emphasize that we don't really know a whole lot about HIV-2 transcription. So down here is HIV-1, and it's a review or a summary of all the factors. I think there's 50-something factors here, okay? And, it, 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 and I think it could be a fair criticism, people have criticized me when I talked about this before, that we've been studying HIV transcription for 30 years, do we really need any more transcription factors than that? So that I would argue maybe. Okay, so, but with HIV-2, for the most part, the only factors we know about are those that we assume, based on sequencing, and what we know about HIV, are, and, and, and sort of, sort of self-fulfilling kind of experiments that, are, are there. So and of kappa B, we do have kappa B, right? SP1. So we really don't know. We have six factors that are potentially binding. So we really don't know about the transcription factors binding. So one factor that can kind of jump out to us is, is this factor here, this flag L1. Um, and this came out to be an HIV2 specific factor found both the LTRs. Um, this is a, a, a C2. Uh, H2 link finger protein, again, it's been suggested to be involved in a variety of uh, maturation systems and uh, controlling cell cycle. Okay. When we overexpress it, we, we haven't done this in primary cells yet, but if we overexpress it, we can see that we get binding to the HIV LTR, and that this binding is associated with recruitment of RNA polymerase. When we look at it functionally in the context of different in both CD4 cell and myeloid cells. Okay, so this is doing knockdown experiments. This is showing we can do the knockdown of the, the, the 501. What we see is that it has really no impact in terms of HIV expression. But we see about a 50 to 70% decrease in HIV2 action. So we think that these preliminary data support the idea that this is a HIV2 specific transcriptional act. And we're trying to pursue that. Now, we really did the screen to generate new hypotheses and to try to understand how the transcriptional networks might tell us something about these different viruses. And I think, one, we have a tool to now start doing comparison with like different clinical isolates or, or viruses from different regions. Like, so we take viruses derived from the brain or viruses derived from uh, lymph nodes and compare them to what we see with laboratory scanners. Um, we can look at some kind of feed and see and make a few comparisons. So with that, we're setting up those experiments right now. But the other thing is we can take this and start doing computational analysis and look at these transcription factors and networks and then ask, what are they connected to? And maybe even identify new novel paths. And so we're again we're just starting to do this. This is all highly preliminary data, and we've identified a number of pathways, in particular notch and wind signal pathways. That might be upstream of a number of these factors that we take them as a whole. And now we're in the process of generating the tools to now start asking how much might be related to these factors. It seems like the pathway for HIV 1 and 2 is somewhat of a lot In, let's say, the next five minutes, it kind of gets to the sort of idea of. Should we be thinking about shock and kill, or are there other ways that we might be able to silence or distinguish viruses? So, I think we're all pretty familiar with shock and kill. The basic strategy is to activate the, 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 the latent cells, purge them, to activate 
radiation will either lead to the cell's death or we can use a couple of you know, toxins of some sort to eliminate those ways to infect the cell. There's been a few problems. One, late to reversing agents, uh, which haven't been all that reliable. Um, two, what are we targeting? What cell population? How much do we have to target? So there's been some interest in terms of trying to silence, and there's a couple of compounds. The, the best one is this uh, dihydrocortisone A, which appears to inhibit cat activity by blocking the ability of cat to improve the CFP. Um, and then there's also the gene therapy strategies trying to do like CRISPR and knock out either uh, co receptors of HIV and or to actually knock out the cell molecule. And in particular, the CRISPR strategies, there's, there's been a, a, several papers now, I think there's only this was about five, but they've been able to excise provirus. And there's even a, a, a paper, actually two papers, where they repurpose Cas9. And by being able to target this, they put a transcriptional activation domain to use it as a purge. So we wanted, we wanted to see if we could maybe repurpose Cas9 to be a repressor. So the idea here was rather than cut it out, let's try to make HIV provirus look like an endogenous recognition. And so to do this, we took a disabled Cas9. So now we can still target this theoretically. The HIV LTR, and we've used it to do a, a zinc finger uh, protein called CRAD. And so the CRAD zinc finger are the largest zinc finger class, the largest transcription factor class in that we have in the gene. And although there's still some controversy over their activity, it seems their primary activity through the recruitment of CAP1 is to repress endogenous outcome. And so they're really involved in sort of genome integrity. So the hypothesis here is that we could target this, and I should point out that these epigenetic changes that are mediated by crab cat mechanism seem to be, they seem to be terrible uh, long-term epigenetic modification. Okay. So what we wanted to do is again, it's sort of proof of concept, um, is to see if we could use this system to repress HIV profile. So we've done these experiments. So these are experiments that we've done in 293 cells, partly to, this, uh, to look at guide RNAs. And what we see is we can identify specific guide RNAs. These tend to have a cluster around the LTR that could repress HIV transcription. We could infect these. Again, this is, I'm going to emphasize this is the 293 model. So we would infect these. And if, when we had the specific guides, we could uh, diminish by up to 80% in some experiments. Uh, uh, transcription activity, and then we also saw this at the level of RNA. When we did this in, I guess, things that look more like T cells, and we're currently trying to do this in primary C4 cells, um, we've done this in infected jerkit cells, and we inhibit replication by on the order of like this looks like about 75%. And this seems to, and, and then we've also looked at JLAX, where we reactivated with a number of latency reversing compounds, and again, this is inhibiting reactivation. Now, only anecdotal, it seems to be long-term. We let some of these cells, like in this scenario, go on for a week, two weeks in culture, and go back and try to, to measure virus replication, it still seems to be around. In addition, we're just not killing cells, so this doesn't seem to be a toxic effect, but we're getting at least molecular changes that are consistent with at least some epigenetic mechanism. So we, we look at, these are uh, chips, and we're looking at the LTR architecture. So if we look at polymerase, we see that the guide RNAs diminished polymerase recruitment to the LTR. We see uh, a diminished uh, acetylation of H3, so less open chromatin marks. And then if we look at trimethylation of lysine 9 of H3, we see that the, the, these are increased compared to control. So we're getting, this is a part of actual transcriptional repression. So we see that we're repressing at that level. We're seeing increases in the market that correlate with repression. So we think this is happening at the genetic level. Okay. So with that said, got to leave everything with bullet points. Hopefully I told you something about the, the establishment and maintenance of different latent populations. In particular, signal might be important. That signal may be pre-existing condition uh, or through the T-cell receptor, but there's probably uh, a threshold of signal that's required for active replication, at least an establishment of a latent reservoir that's easily reversible. There's 
in an in appropriate signaling at the time of infection, it seems to establish a, a population that's a little bit more deep seated. We don't know the long term of that population. Um, intrinsic factors are important, that there's going to be networks of transcription factors that we don't appreciate yet, I don't think, or we're beginning to appreciate that are going to influence HIV replication in different cell populations. And again, just as a proof of concept, you can generate tools to actively repress. How do we get to this tool? Because I don't need to use it here, right? You have to figure out how to deliver it, but there are other strategies that can be applied. So finally, this is my lab. Uh, a lot of the work with um, the different transcription factors, uh, yeast one hybrid system was done by Luis Augusto and Kyle Pedro. Uh, Shin Bao and Luis worked on uh, the TB project. Um, Benita has done some of the DCAS and I, she's working on the opioid project. Um, and then uh, various people supported their efforts. Matt Gagne, who just started a postdoc in Dan Dewey's lab at NIH. Uh, was the one who did the chimeric antigen receptor experiment and developed that system. I've had great collaborations uh, with uh, Wilson Wong in, in engineering. Uh, Rangu Maluru has helped in a lot of different ways. He's a very valued colleague who actually usually that's the way my bad idea. These are the ones that pass wrong. Uh, Juan Wilson Dasa helped with the yeast one hybrid. Kristen Chain is working with us on the opioid. As, long as, uh, as, as well as Kate Cusillo on uh, he's getting the patients. And Karen Jacobson was the clinician that helped us with uh, getting the TB samples. And finally, my funding sources include uh, NIH and NASA. So, Reservoir, and then 
but ART is long term, then you have a compensatory event. So, so I think very early on, cause income can be a major checkpoint. But as time selection and pressure happen, then you start to over layer some of these other mechanisms, in particular, that the higher order epigenetic mechanism at a level of chromosome. And so that's and that's why I would probably argue. So, so two things. One, when we see this sort of open chromosome structure, I think that's one of the problems. We, in many systems that we look at, we always see chromosomes there, and, and it's sort of a bias for the more open chromosome structure. So throwing each inhibitors on that isn't really going to open the chromosome structure up there. But I do think long term, because it's going to come at the cost, it's in the interest of the cell to really shut it down. Um, so I think that's where you start getting some of those other epigenetic markers. And so there's sort of this combinatorial kind of aspect to it where you can get co-opted. Now, and, and just to actually show that they're somewhat linked, when we characterize the causing phenomenon in the first place a few years back, whenever we knock down NEL to release the polymerase, we saw from the model. Likewise, when we knock mess around with uh, the chromatin component of it, we saw a release of the flimmer. So then I think they're actually coupled, and we had a paper sort of making an argument, posing a model, but what was coupling these brands in part was an L stack, which is interactive with both H stacks as well as uh, as flimmer. So it's not so clean when it's off or on, and then you can get, I think, you know, these sort of layers on the shape. Thank you. I I guess I would guess the high affinity because we have sort of this overpowered signaling algorithm. You know, think about these are goal lines for the signaling class, right? Now, it, again, I don't. It's not only the receptor signaling, so you know, maybe, maybe some of this the overcoming kind of you have is in the context of a lot of IL seven or a lot of IL two to be actually provided. Yes, thank you. I think it's durable, but it's gets reused. So how's that? Yeah, so I think it's a fair question. I and mean, we haven't looked, you know, we're setting up to do some of the sequencing and seeing where integration sites are. Um, and I think it's, yeah, it, we just don't know. That, that's a bad answer. I, I, my gut feeling tells me we're not, but I don't know. I just looked at the lesson. These studies showing that um, you see the cells that. The um, viruses in um, transcription of deserts are uh, uh, not uh, something in uh, uh, areas in the chromosome um, less activatable than those in the genetic possible shunt integration. Yeah, it, 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 there's no question. I think it's actually a great question to be asked. Um, we just really haven't done it. Yeah. Um, and, and you could imagine, even if you think of it from an activation perspective, right? You activate these cells to expand and proliferate, so it's going to be a lot more available sites because you can have a lot more chromosome, right? You can start to push off. It just, yeah. And you're going to want to put that viral DNA somewhere. The cell doesn't want DNA, and I think we can provide a possibility. Well, then you would, yeah, that would be like, you know, exactly like a resting cell and being able to frequently do the scavenation. So, most model systems where you try to inject that in a more naive cell. Um, um, you guys have done this, and we've done this, and then uh, uh, you know, 
dog owners who've done this as well as one of the green, usually that's a little bias with the links. Um, and so then, you know, different people have seen sort of different magnitudes of being able to deactivate those cells. We find that they're a bit more resistant to reactivation. Um, so they look a little bit like that to the these receptors. Um, but I would argue that it actually is a nice system. And, and, and I think John and I are kind of talking about these kinds of terms, where you can essentially dissect signal input and the importance of string for different parts of the pathway. And I, I think one thing that's interesting is T cell signaling, there's sort of linear responses. Like when you look at cytokine responses, they tend to be quite linear. So the more signals you put in, the more cytokines you get out. But like the number of T cell responses where you look at maturation or T cell development, the classic example, where you can change peptide concentration by less than two fold, you totally change positive versus negative differentiation. So, yeah, I think it sets up a nice system to see what might be. Involved with getting more of a cell maturation versus maybe more of a, a kind of a linear response to the sort of correct way. So, you know, for example, you can look at egress and you can get the kind of receptor that they do they get back in the second half. Yeah, so 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 Wilson's always a fun guy to talk to because he always builds something in the lab and then he goes he's like figure out something to do with <laughs> and, and and so he does have a bunch of tools that like he has these like split receptors and things like that to kind of get around these problems and then basically when the receptors come together you can get activation and you can do like selection because he, he's thinking a little bit of along the lines of part of each cell kind of so, yeah, I, I haven't talked a little bit about it. We can remember the three of us. Okay. Well, thank you very much.